By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back in Daventer, the Netherlands, for round number two of the Knights of Thorn, the 10th edition of the oldest old school magic, the Gathering tournament in the Netherlands. I'm very excited to show you round number two. We've got Peter Monte from Belgium taking on Dutch player Björn and Peter is playing a, a blue-green mid-range deck. It also has red by the way. It's got some bolts and some fire bolts. Let's not forget. So it's blue, red, green, mid-range and he's taking on Björn and Björn is uh, playing a five-color deck. It's not really five-color good stuff. There's some good stuff in there but I would say five-color randomness. It's a pretty interesting list. And before I dive into the deck decks of both of these players, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to first go to the games, check out the deck decks later. I know some people prefer to do that. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below, because there you will find several timestamps, and one of the timestamps is marked MTG Games. So you click on MTG Games, it'll take you straight to that action. And in the same description below, you can also find more information about the rule set. Today, we are playing according to the Swedish old school rules, meaning no Fallen Empire, one strip mine, and no mana burn. There's just a few things that are connected to this rule set. But if you wanna know more about it, check out the description below for more information. And in that same description below, you can also find the link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page, because yes, yes, we have our own Patreon program. Please consider becoming a patron. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy talks. Okay, and now that you're fully informed, I'm going to continue with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the player on the left, Peter Monte. Let's have a look at his list. And here we see the list of Peter Monte. So this is pretty cool. I like this list. It reminds me of the decks we used to play back in the day because it's very creature heavy. It's mid range. Most of the decks used to be mid range. And um, what I'm really liking here is all the creatures. I love the playset of phantom monsters i think that's great peter like not a lot of people play this creature anymore it's a three three flyer for four and i mean yes it's got three toughness so you can bolt it out of the sky that's true but then again i mean it's still three three you know it's pretty good uh it's got evasion flying is pretty good in old school so i think this card is a little bit underestimated just like rock of Riches is and i can i can kind of see this work in this deck i mean what he wants to do here is you know, play out creatures, kind of ramp up. You've got Ergovian Pixies, you've got um, Urnum Jin, you've got Phantom Monster, you've got Air Elemental, right? So you kind of have that that sly staircase going, you know, where you where you start with the Pixies and then you slowly build up towards your end game, which is your Mahamoti Jin. And then he's also splashed red in here, which I think is a good decision because it gives you access to direct damage. So an alternative way of winning the game. You want to win with combat damage mainly, but then you can finish it with direct damage. And just, you know, a bolt is so versatile. We've seen that, of course, before. Bolt can take out so many annoying turn one creatures of the opponent, but also is great against uh, Mishra's Factory. It's great against like 1-1 one -one creatures that can ruin your game plan, like Preacher, like Prodigal Sorcerer. So, I mean, Bolt is really good Royal Assassin. Um, and then Bolt later in the game when you've almost won, you know, when someone's in Bolt range, you can literally win with your Lightning Bolt. So I think it's a really good decision. Another thing I'd like to point out in this deck is that he's chosen to play with only two Mishra's Factories. And I, I've always find that interesting, you know, because in my personal opinion, feel free to absolutely disagree. I think that too many people always auto include a full play set of Mishra's Factories. I think it's much more interesting to kind of experiment with the amount of factories in your deck. Yes. Some decks, it's fantastic to play with four off, you know. But in other decks, maybe it's better to play three, play two, play one, play none at all. I mean, it has a serious impact on your mana base. Don't underestimate that. And how often do you use that ability to attack with it? I mean, maybe your answer is all the time. And I've got a mega control deck and this is my win con. Of course, then you play with four Mistress Factories. But my point is that not in all the decks, it's an auto-include. And I think one of the things that... Uh, you know, that's difficult for Peter here is the fact that he needs two blue in this deck, you know, and that's probably also why he's got a lot of those blue basics and his deck really needs two blue, you know, two blue allows him to cast his air elementals, it allows him to play his counter magic game, he can play brain geyser, so two blue is really important for him, so from that perspective that you want to have a better mana base, I can understand that he probably took out two Mishra's factories while brewing and discovered, hey, wow, this does wonders to my mana base, and another thing that I really like about Peter's list, again, I don't know if it's the good decision, we'll just have to see, uh, is that he's not playing with mana dorks. Like if you're playing with green, the auto include is Llanowar Elves or when you play multiple colors, Birds of Paradise. And that's that's 
an auto include for a reason because birds of paradise is a fantastic card but i always like it when players make a different decision and say you know what i'm not going to play it i'm going to try it without i'm going to test it out i'm going to see because when players do something new you also get new decks you get new ideas you get new insights and the game moves forward so peter i applaud to you man for not playing four mistress factories and not playing four birds of paradise i think it's nice i'm looking forward to see how it's going to work out for you. So this is the deck of Peter. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent. And here we see the deck of Buren. So, I mean, it's five colors. So I was tempted to call it five color good stuff, but then I kind of zoomed in and I'm like, well, it's not just as simple as that. I mean, there are a lot of other cards in here. So I, w I would be tempted to call it five color stuff. Uh, also because of the deck vote, it's kind of hard to recognize patterns but we do see certain cards that he plays more than one of right we see for example swords to plowshares he plays three of those he plays three suchis um he's plays plays multiple urnum jins um he plays the blue power he plays demonic tutor mind twist you know so that's kind of the obvious choices but then there are also some kind of really nice choices that he's made that's the two-headed giant that's in there i think it's super cool so two-headed giant is a four four with trample for one red and four to cast it's it's pretty good actually the problem is that at that five slot you have so many better options like for example the sarah angel that he's playing um but it or the urnum jit of course which is a four five for just four mana but it's just nice to see these cards getting some action i believe they deserve it there are not a lot of cards with trample there are not a lot of cards in red with trample so two-headed giant it's a pretty cool card talking about cool cards we also see a jade statue in here which i think is quite nice um and i also like the idea of just playing a lot of singles in your deck because it just makes the game very versatile right it's almost like you're playing a singleton deck but with certain key cards that you feel that you need to be competitive like your swords you put multiple in um and because you're playing the singleton match i feel like a, a card like jaylum tome is better right because it kind of helps you to find that one or two answers that you know is in the deck there somewhere but it helps you filter through it a little bit more quickly then when you've stabilized you can play your gm day tome to kind of get that card advantage train going um, when we're looking, talking about one-offs, when we're also looking at the blue uh, part of the deck, I believe we only see one-offs, right? One control magic, one counter spell. Oh, we do see two psionic blasts, so he's playing multiple of those. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, you know, also just playing with one ice storm. I think it's kind of nice because it means you've got ice storm, uh, chaos orb, and your strip mine to, you know, answer some unexpected threats. You know, that's that's kind of nice, um, especially in... In Swedish old school, we have so many strong lands, non-basic lands that you have to deal with. I always think it's good to add a little bit of extra land destruction, you know, you know, in your deck. But um, yeah, this is the uh, the five color stuff deck. You know, Bjorn, let me know if you have a name for this deck. Please let me know in the comments. You know, it's sometimes kind of hard for me to <laughs> to come up with names with these decks. So I'm always happy when players have a name for it. So, but I'm just gonna call it five color stuff um i guess and then i let you as a viewer decide do you think it's good stuff or not okay so this is the list of bjorn we've looked at the deck of peter so that only means one thing we are ready for round number two of the knights of thorn let's go game number one here we go on the right we have bjorn playing with his five color stuff deck and he's taking on peter monta playing a blue a green red mid-range deck he's sitting on the left with the gas adventures playmat Starting with a City of Brass. Both players having really cool playmats, by the way. And that playmat of Bjorn looks amazing. Uh, playing a Tundra, by the way. So Tundra and Mistress Factory passing the turn. Let's see, we can kind of look in the hand of Peter. I see a Felwer Stone. It's kind of hard to see the rest. We do know he's playing with uh, four counter spells and a Mana Drain. So if he can just deploy that Island there. It's got a basic Island in hand. Probably has Counter Magic up now. So it's always kind of nice. And like I said in the deck deck section of the video, Peter Monte is not playing with any mana dorks. So despite the fact that he's playing with green, there are no Lunar Elves or Birds of Paradise in there. And I find that quite interesting. I always like it when players do something else than what you usually see. So I'm really interesting to see how that's going to work out for him. There's another Tundra here by Bjorn. So both players just kind of passing the buck, not doing anything yet. Both players play pretty creature heavy decks. Another thing I really like. And there's the forest. There we see a Felwer Stone. It's really nice here because the Felwer means he still has blue mana to counter if he wants to. Because Bjorn, of course, has blue mana with those two Tundras. But he's also ramping up at the same time. So it's kind of the ideal thing that you want to do when you're playing with a lot of counter spells. 
And Felwer Stone is one of those cards that's quite good in old school because a lot of players play City of Brass. And when there's a City of Brass on the side of your opponent, your Felwer Stone can make any color of mana. So it kind of becomes this magical rock. It's quite cool. I also like the flavor text of uh, Felwer Stone. There we see a Library of Alexandria. And I mean, Bjorn hasn't played out a lot of cards yet. So he was, of course, under play. So I believe he's got six in hand now. So he's going to draw into seven. So, I mean, this is already alarm bells for Peter. And now the game kind of changes, right? Because you can no longer, like, sit back and wait for Bjorn to do something with that Loa. So Loa kind of forces action from you. And if you cannot destroy the land, then the best thing to usually do is put pressure on. The problem is, let's say Peter's going to tap out now and Bjorn has a Swords. You know, that's going to be an issue. Of course, Bjorn will not play that immediately. He would first draw into 7, draw card 8, and then play the Swords. But then you're tapped out. You can't counter. And, you know, your creature is gone for just one white. That's always the issue in these scenarios. So he's going to tap 2. Are we going to see an Argovian Pixies? No, we're not. Okay, but this is even better. Chaos Orb. He's not going to flip, though. Does that mean that Bjorn doesn't have 7 yet? Maybe he's gone to 6 after the draw. So does that mean that he took a mulligan that we perhaps missed? I mean, this makes sense, or else, of course, Bjorn would have already used it. Gonna tap three, four. Okay, what is he gonna do? There we see a phantom monster. So three, three flyer hitting the board. Beautiful to see this creature in action. No response. So Bjorn, of course, first gonna draw his card seven. Yeah, now he's gonna use the Library of Alexandria. And I think the reason that Bjorn is not using the Chaos Orb yet is that he's a little bit afraid of a Disenchant. Remember, in the response of the Chaos Orb activation, you can play a Crumble, Shatter, Disenchant, you know, any spell to destroy the Chaos Orb. So it makes sense. So I think, you know, Peter only wants to use the Chaos Orb if he has counter backup to protect it. He's going to draw another card. The question is, can he now flip on it with protection? First going to attack for three. Bjorn here dropping to 17, so first points of damage. Is he now going to activate? I believe he is. Are we going to see a disenchant? I believe we are. Are we now? Oh, Divine Offering. Are we going to see a counterspell? There's the counterspell. Now, are we going to see a counterspell by Bjorn? That's the question. He plays with, I believe, one mana drain and one counterspell. Really taking his time here. And now remember, Peter still has to hit the flip, right? I mean, it has happened before. Yep, Counterspell resolves. And I think this is a really good move by Peter to really taking his time and not using the Chaos Orb without Counterspell backup. And I'm not sure where the why the players are waiting at the moment. Perhaps there's another option. Are we going to see a second Disenchant? Wow. Another disenchant, but what are we going to see here? Tapping, another counterspell, double counter backup. Wow. That is some serious counter backup. So Peter preferred here to say, okay, Bjorn, I'm going to play out my Phantom Monster, allow you to draw a card from your Loa because I want to wait until I can try to flip when I have two counter spells in hand instead of just one. I mean, I think that's, that's re a really good decision. And now the Loa is gone and the Phantom Monster there on the side of Peter to deal some damage. Gonna tap four. Ooh, control magic. We do see that uh, lightning bolt in hand, but that's not where you want to be if you're Peter. And remember, Bjorn is only playing with a single control magic in the deck, but he has found it here. Yeah, I think if you're Bjorn, you really don't want to play that bolt. Yeah, this is a much better option. Playing the Air Elemental, a 4-4 flying creature. There's a quick short supply of shares, yeah. And this this is the thing. When you play out these bigger creatures and you've got that your opponent has this one mana response, you know, instant speed. It feels so bad. I know how you feel, Peter. It has happened to me plenty of times. But sometimes you're kind of forced to, to go with that plan. Of course, he still has the bolt. Ooh, and now we see this aggro mode by Bjorn, right? He's swinging in, gonna pump the factory. So he could consider playing the bolt here on the factory. Oh, he's got to crumble. That's a better option. Always love to crumble a factory because then your opponent also gains no life. But he is gonna take three, of course, 
from the Phantom and one from his own city of Brest, dropping to 18. And this has really kind of turned into a control game where both players have to think really hard about their resources. There is a counter spell here by Peter, which is quite, quite nice because he's got enough mana to do something and keep counter magic open. Okay, there's a bolt. And yeah, I mean, if you're Bjorn, this is fine because it means he's wasted two cards, right? And the Phantom and the Bolt to one control magic. So it's a card advantage. That's why, of course, control magic is so good if your opponent doesn't have enchantment removal, which is quite hard in the color combination that, uh, of course, Peter's playing in. I mean, at these times, really, an unsummon, for example, shines, right? Because you can unsummon your creature, and then the control magic drops off. But even then, you've got to recast your creature. Anyway, let's uh, focus on the game. We see Black Lotus. Oh, mind twist. Come on. Funny fact, Bjorn told me that he hates the mind twist, but in most of his decks, he does play it. Ooh, he's not going to counter it. That's interesting. You would expect him to counter the uh, the mind twist here. I wonder why Peter's not countering it. He had the mana open. Because the reason to counter it, obviously, is then you would keep your City of Brass. Not that City of Brass is such a good card, but the other effect is that you have another card in hand, and it always makes your opponent wonder, what could it be, you know? Especially against the blue deck where you play with counter magic. So it can influence the way your opponent plays. You always see a strip mine, yeah, it's, it's looking bad now here for uh, for Peter being in top decking mode. He needs uh, an Ancestral Recall, for example, to kind of get back into this. It's another card for Peter. There's an Argovian Pixies, okay, that's quite good. Pretty big chance it's gonna get killed, but if it doesn't, it's a perfect blocker for the Mistress Factory, of course, because uh, all damage dealt to the uh, Argovian Pixies by Artifacts is reduced to zero. There we see a tap. Okay, we see a soul ring, not a uh, sword to plowshares. Oh, there's a Sarah Angel. Yeah, that's bad. Oh, mana drain. Perfect mana drain. If he can now draw into his brain geyser, that would be living the dream. He's going to get five mana. Is it going to be the brain geyser? That would almost give him the victory, right? If it's the Brain Geyser, because that would mean you, you draw so many cards. Tapping one blue. Okay, there is a clone. So he's going to clone the Pixies. Uh-oh, in response. Yeah, this is the worst. This is the absolute worst. Because now there's no target left for the clone, so the clone's going to die. Yeah, this is this is the worst case scenario here for Peter Monte. Yeah, this is this is almost the the end of the road for Peter. You really needed this uh, this clone, I think, to stick. Also, because now, of course, the factories are going to run through, so he's going to drop to ten. And just passing the turn, you one card in hand, two cards in hand for Bjorn, by the way. So it's looking good for him. Going to swing in for four. So Peter dropping to six. There's the pass. Another card for him. Okay, there's an air elemental. Hopefully this sticks for Peter. I mean, he's on six. But this air elemental is pretty big, so it kind of stops the attacks by Bjorn. And remember, Bjorn also only has two cards in hand. So one card for Peter, and Bjorn going to draw into card number three here. Are we going to see that two-headed giant? And he doesn't have red. Ah, that's too bad. I'm hoping really to see Bjorn cast his two-headed giant. It's a card we don't see often, so always enjoy seeing cards hitting the board that don't see a lot of play. So Bjorn on six cannot really attack with the air elemental being so low. Unless, of course, he's got another creature to block the factories. He is going to play something, it seems. <coughs> there is a Mishra's Factory. Okay. <coughs> Not too shabby. Now, do remember, Bjorn does have that strip mine. And he's going to pass the turn back here to Bjorn. And Bjorn passing the turn as well. So, both players kind of top decking. So, this is not a done deal at all. 
Okay, there's a Jalen Tome. I think that's quite good when you're in top decking mode. Jalen Tome can really help you. Yeah, I'm expecting him to use it straight away. Let's see what he's going to discard. What has he been holding up in his hand? Tropical Island. Yeah, it just lands. It's Tropical Island into the bin. And now the third card here for Peter. Icy Manipulator. Okay. I mean, he's going places. It's not too bad. I mean, I'm sure if you're paid there, it must be so, you know, you want to start attacking with the air elemental, but you have to be patient. There's another island. Paid there having one card in hand. <laughs> and passing the turn back to Bjorn. And then maybe in his upkeep he wants to tap something. Yeah, that's always the question. Are you going to do that? I think in this case, maybe I would just, yeah, just wait until combat or whatever, you know. Wait till the end step. And here we see Bjorn really filtering through his deck, right? Dropping the lance at Jalem Tome is going to make the difference, I feel. Ooh, there's an Urnum. Are we going to see a counterspell by Peter? I don't think so. I had a quick glance at his card, put it back. Of course, Peter does have the Icy. What is he going to tap down here? Tapping down the Tundra, so Peter has no access to blue or white. And he still has to untap those lands there, I believe. Two cards in hand now after the draw. Ooh, look at this. He's going to attack with the Air Elemental. That is, does it mean... That he's got something else in hand here to play out to deal with a potential attack. He's got the Icy, of course, to tap down the Urnum. Does it mean he's got, like, a Lightning Bolt in hand? It is risky, but, of course, I think, I mean, if you're paid, you're like, okay, he's got the Jalem Dome. He's going to filter through. He's got more life than me. At a certain point, I have to start attacking with my Air Elemental. So I understand this move. I mean, if you just keep sitting back and, and waiting for something to happen, you're probably going to lose. Here we see the strip mine on the Mishra's factory. And then, yeah, he's going to use that mana from the factory in response to tap down the Urnum. That makes sense. Then we see animation of both of the factories and attack for four. And I, I'm expecting to see at least a bolt here. Yeah. Lightning bolt on one of them. But now he's going to drop to three there we see a Jalem activation. Okay, and there's another land in the bin. So Bjorn really turning his lands into useful spells and permanents, thanks to the Jalem Tome. Two cards in hand here for Peter. There's a forest, tapping the forests. Tapping four, what are we going to see for four? There's a gem day tome. Now this is interesting. This is really interesting. I think if you're Peter, you cannot afford to attack her. Just gotta pass exactly. You're gonna tap down the Urnum. And then it gets interesting, right? Are you gonna draw a card with your gem day tome? That's gonna cost you life because of the city of brasses. And then the question is, does it matter whether whether or not I'm on one or I'm on three? I mean, I wonder if it really does. I think it would be worth drawing that card, but I mean, who am I? Oh, there's a psionic blast. I think that's the end. Like, he can use his Gemday Tome to find an answer, but he doesn't have a counter spell for just one. So it is what it is here. Bjorn finishing it with that psionic blast in game one. Now, both players are going into their sideboards, and we will catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So I believe we see Peter taking a mulligan here. Going to six, he's also on the play. Not a great start. Well, this is a great start for him, but I mean, starting with a card less. So forced into Sol Ring, that's good. So maybe next turn he's got an island. He can, oh man, there's a strip on a forest. Not the worst thing to happen, but what I wanted to say is if uh, Peter can, could have found an island, he could have cast Phantom Monster turn two. That would be a really cool move. Instead, there's just a Taiga and a Go. There we see a Trop, there is a Pearl, Disenchant there on the Soaring. That's too bad that Peter couldn't use 
the uh, the soul ring not even once we do see a crumble here on the pearl and i believe we see a strip mining hand there for peter so he could consider stripping the trop there's a mox emerald there's a strip mine is he going to strip the trop bjorn kind of counting on it they're already reaching his land but peter decides not to passing the turn there's a savannah and a pass Let's see what Peter can do in his turn. Does he have a land, for example? I don't think he does. I see a lightning bolt in hand. What else do we see? There's another trap, but yeah, Peter missing a land up here. That's tough. Let's see if Bjorn can take advantage. There's a time walk, okay. Drawing another card. Is he gonna go to four lands? And if so, is he also able to play a threat? Ooh, maybe this is even better. Disenchant really taking care of that mana base here by Peter. yeah this is bad news for Peter. not a single blue source and only two lands one of them being a strip mine this is really tough does he have an option here gonna tap two are we gonna see that regrowth that I talked about earlier I do believe it's there in his hand yep that's the regrowth what are you gonna get back okay gonna go for the forest I was thinking maybe the soul ring because it gives you double mana then again it's it's of course very easy to get rid of you know with all your all the artifact hate that bjorn is playing bjorn's tapping five here by the way there she is sarah angel hitting the board this is a problem for peter what is he gonna do I'm gonna tap two there's an argovian pixies two one from antiquities passing to turn back to bjorn bjorn of course uh, having that sarah can just fly over the Pixies, exactly, Peter dropping to 16. There's another Savannah and a pass. So, I mean, the good news for Peters, I guess there's not more problems hitting the board, but I think he really, really needs a blue source. I believe, yeah, there's a Control Magic in hand there for Peter, but he just doesn't have any blue cards. There's the Bolt. Are we going to see Counterspell on the Bolt? Nope, we're not. Okay, woo. If Bjorn would have had a counter spell for this bolt, that would have been disastrous for, for, um, for Peter. Anyway, there's the blue source now. Okay, Icy Manipulator passing the turn. Let's see what Bjorn can do. There's a Jalem Tome. So remember, Jalem Tome was really good in game one, right? It really helps you to find the cards you need. Don't underestimate that little book. Let's see if Peter has an answer. Okay, he's got maybe something better. Here's an Urnum Gin, 4 or 5 Powerhouse, but there's a Quick Sword to Plowshares, though. Does mean Peter goes back up to 20. And Bjorn is going to use the book. Going to discard an Ice Storm, passing the turn. Interesting choice, right, to get rid of the Ice Storm. Considering your opponent isn't so much mana, mana problems, you could have played that Ice Storm on, for example, the, the Island but chooses not to, so it also makes you wonder what type of cards he's got in hand. Maybe he's got more swords in hand. He's not really worried about creature threats coming in by the side of Peter. Maybe he's got a control magic in hand and he wants Peter to play out a bigger creature. A lot of options here. Okay, here we see the two-headed giant. Yeah, I was hoping to see this card uh, get some action. And I always love when this happens when your opponent reach your card. I mean, for me, that's the biggest compliment you can have. So, uh, two had a giant, a 4 4 trample creature that can actually block two creatures because it's got two heads. It makes sense. It's so flavorful. Ooh, is he going to play the control magic? We know he has it. Oh, control magic. Oh. Does Bjorn now have a disenchant? And this is where maybe the ice storm on the island could have been, been a good decision earlier, but he decided to discard it. Discarding his mox ruby now. But hey, maybe he's got a disenchant and then it's all good. Yeah, there we go. Red Elemental Blast coming in from the sideboard. Giving him back his giant. So he wasn't too concerned. And then we see, of course, Peter all the time tapping down the City of Brasses, which is something I also really enjoy doing when I'm playing my Timmy Spellbook deck because you just every time you, you ping your opponent for one, it kind of feels good. But I mean, Peter... He's got, I mean, he still has the Ice Manipulator to tap down the Giant, so it's not the end of the world. He's still on 20. But I think if you're Peter, you're really annoyed by the Jalem Tome on the side of Bjorn. Because every time he draws, like, a mana source, he can just... 
uh, put it in the bin and get a card for it, replace it by another card with the JLM tone. And that's really where, in my opinion, the JLM tone shines when you're kind of in that mid game and you know you, you kind of have enough mana already and you kind of can swap your mana out for, for other cards that might be useful. I also really like JLM tone with land text, for example, for that reason. Anyway, Peter here pretty much in the tank. Bjorn on 14, Peter on 20. Three cards in hand for Bjorn, I believe. I see Peter with two cards in hand. It's again one of those moments where, you know, if you draw into into power, that can make all the difference, right? An ancestral recall, brain geyser can make difference here. If of course it doesn't get countered. There's the pass turn. So Peter not really doing anything else, just passing the turn back to Bjorn. Bjorn drawing card number four. Is he going to use the Jellum Tome his first main or his second main? That's the question. Now, he's first going to attack. Look at that. Pater taking the damage. He prefers to tap down the City of Brass, it seems. There's a tapping of four. There's an Urnum Jin. Wow, that's just a lot of firepower. Now, are we going to see a counter spell here by Pater? I mean, we know his deck's got four counter spells and a mana drain. Question is, does he have one of them in hand? Okay, there is a counter spell on the Urnum. Kind of has to, right? I mean, if you don't, you would take eight damage next turn. Of course, you've got the Icy, so you can make it only four, but still, it would be a clock. Look at that, gonna tap two. There's a Disenchant. And now you kind of wish you would have used the Icy for the two-headed giant, right? Because then you would have still been on, uh, on 20. Okay, there's an Air Elemental. That's kind of nice. Air Elemental 4-4 four, four Flyer. And remember, Bjorn's on 12, Pater's on 16. So, I mean, if you're Pater, you're probably just going to take the 4 damage from the Giant, going to drop to 12, and then you're going to attack him, you know, because Bjorn is lower. He's on a 3-turn clock, you're on a 4-turn clock. Is that risky? Yes, but I mean, it is a path to victory. So here we see him discard. Ah, man. And again, we see the Jalem Tome doing work, right? And he's going to stay on 16 because he gains 4 from the Swords on the Air Elemental and then 4 is taken away from the Giant. So he's still on 16. Second card here for Peter. Remember, Peter has to win this already one game down. Round number 2 of the Knights of Thorn, the 10th edition in Deventer, the Netherlands. There we see a tap of 4. There's an Urnum Jin hitting the board 4-5. What are we going to see here? So 4 or 5 is a perfect blocker for that two-headed giant. There's a tap of 4. There's a Suchi. There's a pass. And now he's got to give Forest Walk to one of the two creatures. Going to give it to the Suchi. And I mean, this is relevant, right? Because now he can attack. And it cannot be blocked because it has Forest Walk. There's the attack. So this is a potential double block that Bjorn can do. He's going to go for the double block. And he's going to kill the Suchi. Interesting move to go for the Suchi. You would think, because you probably have more uh, removal for artifacts, you would go for the two-headed giant instead. Maybe he boarded in blue elemental blasts, but I don't think so. <coughs> so I think I would have gone... Here for the two-headed giant. There's the attack. Gonna take four, it seems. Gonna go to 12. And now he's gonna use the tome again, trying to find an answer for that phantom monster. And again, just, you know, dropping the mana he doesn't need and get probably useful cards in return. Playing a Tundra here, passing the turn. There's a draw. There's the attack for three. Gonna put Bjorn on nine. But Peter's probably gonna drop to eight next turn. Okay, there's an air elemental. Ooh, mana drain though. There's a mana. Ah, that's too bad. And it's looking really good for Bjorn here. So Bjorn having five cards now from his own mana drain. 
He's going to use two of those for the Jalem Tome, so three mana still floating. Going to drop another Mox. There's a Suchi, yeah. A lot of firepower now coming from Bjorn. Bjorn's deck is going on all cylinders now. And I mean, Pater on eight has to keep the Phantom Monster as a blocker. Passing the turn. Two cards in hand for Pater. Bjorn drawing card number three. Or is it card? No, it's card number two, it seems. There's a double attack. Has to block probably the Suchi, right? Because the Giant has Trample. Gonna drop to four. There's the pass. Oh, three cards in hand. Need something. He's on four life. Nope. That's it. End of the road for Peter. Congratulations, Bjorn. Winning here in round number two. And here we see Bjorn's deck. Well, well done. Yeah. And uh, the Jalum Tome, I think that was the MVP of this match, right? In game one, it had a big role. In game two, it had a big role. And yeah, here you can see the strength of a simple card like that that is often overlooked in uh, deck builder spell books when they start making their decks. Anyway, this was episode number two of round number two of the Knights of Thorn. Now, if you enjoyed this, please leave a like, share this on your socials, and leave a comment. All these things are free and really help the channel move for, uh, forward. And talking about that, if you don't want to miss a thing, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Okay, and now that that's all out of the way, there's one last thing that I'd like to share with you, and that is the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And you can find that on Patreon slash patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. If you enjoy what I do, if you enjoy the content that I make, please consider becoming a patron of the show. It already starts for just $1 a month, and for that dollar, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord page, and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. Somebody can see.